Hi, everyone. We are back. We are live and alive. It's Tuesday, and it's an interview. And we've got William Chavez on the show with us. William, before we get any further, uh, AFS is in uh, ooh, less than a couple weeks. It's coming up. By the time you're watching this YouTube video, uh, well, this is clipped to... Hi, if you're watching this clip to YouTube, it'll be like days away. So I'm going to open this up with the plug right uh, right off top, okay? Uh, hey, if people want to find you at AFS, where are you going to be specifically Friday night, and what are you going to be doing? I'm going to be playing board games. At first, I messaged you like, hey, are there people interested in this type of thing? Because uh, there's some games I'd like to play. They're rather complex. With folklorists. With folklorists. Uh, and we were you know, kicking things around, and then unbeknownst to you or I, this was also something that the official program was interested in doing. And so oh, it's, kind it's of beno- a my... little beknownst to me. I had an inkling. <laughs> but the point is, is that it's not just my weird games that will be featured. Uh, other yes. games will be there too, which is great. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm bringing fun things. I'm bringing my Switch. We'll have uh, uh we'll be playing Switch games on the projector. Uh, break. Uh, we'll have Smash. We'll have Tekken or Tatsujin. What are you going to be playing uh, on the board game tabletop end of the room? So it's related to my paper that will be on Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, do you want Friday? What time? Friday? What time? Uh, Friday. That's a good question. Friday. Ten thirty. Ten thirty a.m. to uh, noon thirty. Oh, cool. So it does not conflict with my uh, with my paper. <laughs> I'm eight thirty. Yeah. At time. Uh, yeah, if you want to, I can either spill it out or if you I, want, you can share it, Daisy. I got it. I'm gonna drop it in the chat in two Ooh, separate comments, and it's up on it's up on the screen too. People watching this video will be able to see the title of your paper. Nice. Wow, and yeah. the abstract. <laughs> You've outdone yourself, mod. <laughs> so, me, I can make sure it comes. Th- oh, okay. <laughs> So just just so I can give <laughs> just so I can give you know just I can read it too but um, there's three games in particular uh, one is the uh, uh, betrayal at House on the Hill yep right uh, which the other is, is... freaking fun game I've played it before classic it is game. awesome classic you get to like the game board itself is built on itself and is really cool like it's very fun and interactive yeah. And one of you may betray each other. You you might. There may be some betrayal that night. Um, There is also Fury of Dracula, uh, which is very, very faithful uh, to the book, which would be fun for any any Bram Stoker fans. Jared, Jared, where are you at? Jared, you're watching this. Jared, where are you? Where are you? (laughs) Garlic uh, in the chat. Garlic in the chat for Fury of Dracula, everybody. Garlic in the chat. And then there's a Abomination, which is the Heir of Frankenstein, oh, yeah. which we'll get to. Of You're in a race against your other players to uh, build the next Frankenstein, uh, or at least Frankenstein's monster, as it were. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about this, but the, way, the, the dastardly ways in which you bring about that monster are really fun and insidious. And the more steps that you take, so if you're you know, divin- digging up graves, or if you're stealing things from the morgue, or if you're actually killing people and using body parts, all of those things will decrease your humanity meter uh, and scale. And Damn. it then it then uh, affects the kind of the randomness. You have really hard odds of dice rolling and other things going on. Uh, so less things will go in your favor. Fate will not look favorably upon you uh, the more that you lose your humanity. Nice. But, that also speeds up the process as you're in a race to try and build this beast. And so uh, if I can just read fast this uh, little abstract of why am I you know, focusing on these games uh, in my paper slash why am I interested to play them with folklorists. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm investigating you know, gothic horror. Gothic horror as a theme in gameplay uh, and also the interactive fiction that comes with these games. And so... Uh, the use of horror as an instrument of moral sensationalism. Uh, what that means is that a lot of times in horror, uh, bad things befall certain character types. And that's usually related to moral, you know, declension or, or deviant, you know, character types and so forth. And so 
if that is the sure way to understand why some, why certain characters are exploited and why they have such a expose of suffering, that hinders the genre's immediate game design. Because why would you pick the character that is always going to lose or always going to suffer? Mm-hmm. And so Gothic Dread, however, presents the ultimate equalizer for both horror gameplay and interactive fiction. Uh, the selected tabletop games are constructed around downward transcendence fatalism, and self-destruction. They exploit fears of inundation to be overpowered and seized by oppressive game spaces and mechanics. And so Daisy uh, pitching the the trail on the house house on the hill, uh, it's a really large structure and Gothic horror has these large castles and cathedrals and everything else that overpower you with their space, right? What used to be some Victoria era, you know, gaudy construction that is, you know, is now excessive in its emptiness, right? And so uh, then as you play the games, narratives progress and conditions worsen as certain players are made abject, producing asymmetric gameplay and monster control slash builds reflective of villain uh, sympathy and heroic disenchantment. Gameplay variant stems from mystery and forced repetition prompting the Academy to reconsider the legacy of Gothic storytelling. And so we're l- using the medium of games to tell this story and engage these themes. Collectively, together. And together. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna plug right away. Oh, they, oh go ahead. Mm, we might be thinking about Is it the carterhouseschool.com because their new class is the Gothic Realms? No, but that's amazing. Well, I'm plugging it right away because Carter High School is doing a program on uh, on uh, on the Gothic aesthetic and folklore. Um, I was you made me think about Michael Coven's um horror folk tales and you always films, do me thinking about Michael Coven. I don't Coven. know. Well, okay, don't say it like that. He, that might be weird. <laughs> I'm just thinking about <laughs> movies and horror and folklore because it makes so much sense. But sure. I didn't know if you had thought about that before um, at all uh, as like another scholar who might be speaking to similar like motifs in a different kind of pop culture medium. Yeah. But I don't know. So, it's freaking cool. I, 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 I focus on it a lot in film. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a lot of what my scholarship has become. But I'm really interested, thus why we're here playing video games mm-hmm. and everything else. Yeah, I am. I am interested in games, and we'll talk about you know the video game course that I also offer. But oh yes, uh, we will. I feel, I feel like uh, Dami and I talked about this that the study of games, at least to me, I'd love to learn more of it if it's out there and I just missed it. But it seems to be that the the popularity of scholarship as it relates to games were really high like i can point to scholars of things like D and dungeons and dragons right with role-playing games sure and sure i can also point to scholars of contemporary video games but i feel like the tabletop resurgence of we're not just playing monopoly we're not just playing clue or whatever right you know not just Catan, mm-hmm. but other weird things that really get complex um i'm really curious where that is in the scholarship and where the study of that as a resurgence of games uh where it's been and so this talk that at afs is also me trying to fill that void slash meet other people that are interested in these type of games like me there's a sociologist at uh iu fabio i don't remember his last name who studies this game tabletop games tabletop games yeah um well Either way, underrepresented, underrepresented, uh, subject it, yeah. to, underrepresented subject to apply some of these like critical theories about pop culture and religious studies too. Well, so, days. I was about to say, uh, I the first question is going to bleed over perfectly into this, but I want yeah, you to do something really before is. I ask this first question. <laughs> yes, this is very important. Um, chatters, you may see Dom and I on the show a lot. Um, our faces, our corporeal forms, our essences, my disembodied voice many times, Dom's voice as well as body, sometimes on camera. Okay, Dream many- Brain, it's only 9.30. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what you may not know is that uh, for the questions that we ask, we have a whole team of people um, who make up Folkwise, and this team 
for for interview questions specifically, we lovingly call the interview sleuths. Uh, that includes a number of us of different combinations every week who research our guest, come up with good questions for them, um, and just overall do do the work to make our questions interesting to listeners at home of a wide range of audiences. So if you hear a question that you like, if William hears a question and thinks it's funny or thinks it's good or feels very empowered and gives a wonderful answer by it or to the question, uh, don't thank me and Dom. Thank the sleuths. And with that, I'm going to get into your first question, William, uh, which is pretty relevant because it is. Uh, Let's see. How do we start? Uh, Br- Brian Sutton Smith, the great uh, folklorist and play scholar, described the triviality barrier, where often play studies or children's folklore doesn't uh, get as much study as is represented in culture uh, because it is treated as trivial culture. With that in mind, how the hell did you get a syllabus about religion and video games approved through your university? <laughs> um, I'm actually very proud of that one. Um, <laughs> So right now I'm a lecturer at UCSB. I, I just completed my PhD just you know a month ago. Um, Doctor, so, thank you. And so uh, just by happenstance, it, it you know the, the stars aligned that there were uh, a hole in the curriculum. Different American scholars were either on leave or they've taken on new committee roles or grant things where they have course relief, and so. There's a need for Americanist content mm-hmm. uh, in the religious studies department at my university, and right place, right time, I could offer and I could, you know, adjust uh, and fill that gap. And so the classes that I'm teaching this year, up until spring, are things like religion and the American experience. Last time I, I taught it last year, and it was on possession narratives and conspiracy theories, which was really fun, and you know, people really liked it. And but one of the other uh, feedbacks that I got for it was could could you just as like an interesting challenge could you do the same thing not with horror but with comedy and so the one that I'm teaching in the winter is on you know comedy and the American experience. Um, oh, that's the awesome. One in the, yeah, the one in the in the in the spring is religion and film, which I've done before, and so they needed another one, and I told them if you let me, I can do a really good video game class and. They the, the right people supported me. I was able to get it out there, uh, and Hell in yeah. reference in reference to your the first you know clause of your question about the triviality of you know child's play. What's really interesting is because I'm teaching it right now. One of the one of the people that I give them or to to read is a guy named uh, Colin Kremen who is using Deleuze and Guattari in reference to video games. Do mm-hmm. y'all? I'm a religious studies person, so I don't even know. Do folklorists read Deleuze and Guattari? Uh, uh, I, I read a little bit of uh, Deleuze and Guattari I'll, I'll, for like I two do. classes. I do. Daisy I do. does I in, do. in comparative <laughs> studies. Yeah. I, love, I love Deleuze. <laughs> right? And so, Sue Tui assigned Deleuze in her class. Yeah. Yes. Specifically, like Thousand Plateaus, like I don't know where it is. It's in the end. Before the intro even starts, it might be the acknowledgments. They straight up tell you, you can read it these chapters in any order you want right and so they're really big on non-linearity yes. you sort of yes. figuring it out as authors not wanting to control your experience as a reader right and the way that the the metaphor that Deleuze especially uh, you know is really great at is the rhizome if yeah. you want to google the image of the rhizome rather than the avarescent which is the tree right the the branches of, and the leaves and everything of the tree will not extend out of the territory of its roots right and it sort of just grows vertically even if it pushes out it's still connected in the network of the tree whereas the rhizome can branch out away from its original structure and in Deleuze words deterritorialize and carve out a new you know demarcated area for itself as it grows laterally like and, like like grass or something right i yeah. cannot i cannot explain how much you are speaking my language Oh my god, right this now. is Daisy. This is Daisy. <laughs> and so this guy Kremen is really big on the the it's it's very normative, right? Video game studies and video game scholarship and evaluation is very normative, right? It's not engaging as much description but also what should be, what mm-hmm. ought to be. And for this guy Kremen, the way that games ought to be is they need to allow for rhizomatic play 
which means that they offer lines of flight out of the rigid structure of what the develop developer has preconceived, right? If the developer oh preconceives my. such a rigid structure of a game and doesn't allow for new things to develop and new emergent gameplay to develop or emerge, then it's not a proper video game in his eyes. Mm. I can right. think of three good and very different examples of that that are just like exploding my brain. Can right I go now. off? Can oh. I go off right now? Before. Yeah, well, you, well, just, you just, you just, you just, you're say. describing the difference between Smash Brawl and Smash Melee. Smash Melee it yep. was a rushed game, and the physics engine wasn't done. No, it's just rhizomatic. Yes, and it's 2022, and mm. we're still figuring out new and fun things to do in that game. Yeah, exactly. That's and this guy's, you know, understanding and approach to game design. That is a good thing. That's a good game design. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All, all I gotta say is this: this guy plays hella Minecraft. I was gonna say, yeah, Daisy's probably right. thinking about Minecraft. This is my favorite <laughs> game. This guy, yeah, <laughs> so, actually, actually, I don't know if you saw the face re reveal, but uh, Dream was actually just Deleuze and Guattari under the mask, both of them. I so, really was, yeah. At the same time, so, yeah. yes. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the the dumb academic terms, and then I'll give you the far better popular terms. Oh, th um, that's what the show's dream. about. That's the that's the name of the show. Off. No, no MK two in the or MK eleven in the background literally just teach us. <laughs> oh, do you um, do y'all watch uh, Maximilian Dodd? Oh no yeah, I watch Dodd. Max all the time. Big fighting game guy. Yep. Great, great YouTuber, content maker, mm -hmm. and so I know Twitch. Guy, Shouts out to Twitch. <laughs> yeah, and so this guy, this guy Kremen uses words like smooth and striated, right? And so. Mm -hmm. The example that he gives is like if you're playing Goldeneye or something, right? The way in which you can fluidly move in the room, right, is a smooth space for you to generate emergent gameplay. However, once you get to a wall, you and if you want to keep moving, you're just going to keep hitting the wall. Or if you scale the wall, you now can only move in the trajectory that is outlined by its physics. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that is the striated path. It's it's too rigid. It's too predetermined. You have to move it that way, right? Like everything is ladders. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> right. And so you know, there's there's. Did y'all ever play like Firewatch? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Um. So it's it's like an exploratory game, you know, in the wilderness. But there's a lot of invisible walls that it's a, the illusion of choice. I yeah. can't actually explore that many things. I can mm -hmm. only explore what the game has wanted me to explore. So it's a more of a predetermined experience that is striated in this guy's uh, terminology, mm -hmm. right? If you go and watch, just Google it after this, um, Maximilian Dodd, his terminology is loose and tight. Yeah. Tight game structure. Another right? video. Another video you're talking pre about. And predetermined, right? Emergent gameplay, rhizomatic play, smooth, etc., is loose, right? And so something like Melee is very loose in its game design, in its structure, that allows a lot of emergent gameplay to manifest. All right, that that that's the interview. He summed up the show. That was it. <laughs> he did well, the show. Well, I also I also haven't even right. I also haven't even told you what all this has to do with religion. Or yeah, or Bring what any home. of this Bring has to home, do with Lloyd. how you got. <laughs> He's the right people. He the right people in this corner. There, he said right? that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I I'm not in my office, but if I were, and maybe next time I'll sit, I'll send you some images, and you know I can give a shout out to it. Um, Google musketeer chess variants, right? Musketeer chess variants. The, for any of you that play chess, these are they're online. They're called fairy pieces, right? New ways of playing, basically chess expansion. Right? Because mm. what is it? It's the wow. it's a pawn. A, update, a pawn, update for chess just dropped. Right? There's a what? A pawn, a king, a queen, the bishop, the rook, and the knight. That's six pieces, mm -hmm. right? And six distinct, another dumb academic word, uh, haxiety, which means a thingness, a distinction, right? Oh, wow. there's, there's, there's six distinct pieces, right? And the way that they move. Musketeer chess has, has a rhino, it has a lion, it has an elephant, it has a camel. It has an archbishop, a chancellor, a fortress, cannons, all sorts of fun things that all move differently, mm -hmm. right? And so the question is, is, and this comes like one of the 
the very provocative essays that I assigned my students is one of the, the readers, Bremen actually, is going to argue that video game chess is not a real video game because it's too straight. It doesn't allow for emergent gameplay. And as soon as you make a move, you're now entering a delimited set of potential possibilities, right? Mm-hmm. This is also why we const- consistently lose. Sense. Yeah. And this is also why we consistently lose to AI, yeah. right? Because it's not allowing yeah. for emergent gameplay. And so the real chess, right, in his mind, of, he doesn't say this, but as an interesting sort of counter, how do we make chess emergent, right? One, by adding new game mechanics and, you know, 3D chess, or there's a three-person chess too, which is really cool. But the, let's say I buy these Musketeer chess sets, right? And if I open it up, it comes with instructions for how the piece moves, right? The question then becomes, do I have to listen? Do I have to obey the predetermined structure of how the chest, the new pieces move, how the elephant moves, the camel moves, etc.? Or could I, through house rules, through childhood triviality, invent my own way and, and, and movement of a chess piece? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah. I only have one follow-up question. Why are you so cool? Okay, continue. You don't need to answer that. <laughs> and so what's what's great, for any, of you, for any of you that have like played a certain game or played cards or whatever else, you might have heard this phrase come from someone or maybe your own lips say, you're not playing the game right, right? What does that mean, yeah. right? Oh, my gosh. To- well, I'm just thinking about the study. I'm just thinking about folklore as a study of house rules. Right? And James, does real, James Dalton Bell say that? Is that no, that was that, that was a, that? Uh, an English major at IU said that to me. Bar, what is it? Bar Tolkien folklore is uh, what is it? Informal, communal, mm-hmm. and uh, damn, I can't remember the third one. But right, so it's like the the way in which you find the folklore is in this informality. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, and and what is communal? And so, oh, lo- local, communal, informal. It's local. Yeah. That's what it is. Local, mm-hmm. communal, informal. Um, and so that is what is going on, right, on the ground level, right? And so the whole point of all of this is when you say something or when you hear somebody say, you're not playing the game right, right? It's really interesting because whether it's a, a video game or board game with pieces or cards or whatever the technology is, there's this looming cultural approach that makes the, the, that structures the realm of play. If you know Bordeaux and, you know, relational sociology, it's the habitus, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There is a habitus Mm -hmm. of play, right, that governs you should be playing this way. And so if you're a tournament player, you you play with no items and you only do Final Destination or the Omega levels or whatever, right? That is a style of play. But I'll I'll let it pass. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Right. And so like, but that is a a convention of a community of practice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of of gameplay convention. And mm-hmm. that is a habitus of play that's different from someone who likes Smash Balls or whatever, Pokemon mm-hmm. Balls or whatever yeah. else they want to do, right? And so, or timed or stamina or blah. And so Coins. all of the, right? All of those things are conflicting with each other based on whatever community of practice is implementing the house rules as it were, right? And so mm-hmm. that's really fun and interesting to study of as a gaming culture, We are concerned with normative statements of what ought to be and how games should be and how things should be played, right? And we use this, at least I do, as a heuristic, right? It's a social heuristic to learn about how people organize groups, how they socialize, how they invent rules, how they follow rules, how they break rules, right? And there's something functionally religious about that as a religious studies scholar. I recognize something familiar about that social structure. Does that make sense? Yeah, there, it, I am it totally, does. I'm totally following you. And the part that like makes me interested, I mean, I'm interested in general, but the part that gets my brain going is whether or not somebody says, you're not playing the game right, or that's not how I've played the game, or... I don't know how to play that way. Would you tell me what way you play? Because I play a different way. Like those interpersonal communicative, like linguistic artistic pieces, communication, you might say. Yeah, like those those ways of both enacting authority or defensiveness. Like that's the piece yes. that I'm interested in. 
and like yes you're, you're blowing and, my mind right now yes and that okay. that move to mm -hmm. acknowledge cultural precedent right mm -hmm. is a, is a mm -hmm. really really functional thing to do yes right? absolutely yeah and well and there, like how do we yeah how do we invite people into our play space versus i've never played that way before and, or like, and, but, <laughs> that's but also, fascinating to me <laughs> yes but again so oh it's gosh, like so you, cool. using games as a social heuristic to understand yeah. human behavior right mm -hmm. and so let's say mm -hmm. i'm not talking about video games but i'm still looking for emergent gameplay in the practice of religion what kind of religions provide the striated tight game design where they have predetermined your participation versus which ones are cool and loose right and smooth that are inviting of emergent gameplay, right? Or and, when does it sort of happen on its own? Yeah. Or when does it become so emergent that it no longer becomes a game, but rather something that is disconnected from the the physical, I don't know, like the reality of the gameplay or something like that. Like when it is so far removed that it becomes nebulous and about something else. Mm. If that well, makes sense. I guess I'm, I'm, still trying to like, I'm still trying to track well, the metaphor of religion, but yeah, I think I got you, Daisy. Bo both I'm of those thinking of like a, like a cult that is by an individual who changes the rules all the time and nobody can keep up with it or that the rules are kind of so vague oh, that sure. the interpretation is different. But if you don't know the rule, then you are punished or something like that, whatever. But there's also like single player campaigns in games, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing. It's like, wh wh it's when do we... Yeah. When do we allow for massive multiplayer online, you know, of the metaphor of religion versus, mm -hmm. you know, local, you know, communal play versus, you know, single player individualistic ones, right? And so gaming this aesthetics, is... all those things. I don't want to say it's not structuralist, but you're like looking at the structure and the ways that people break it. It's a yes. little structuralist. Or something. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, it's, I don't. We're, we're kind of stuck with a post-structuralist model. Yeah. Yeah, I would say you're like, yeah, you're doing the. That's an interesting, but I mean, religion is very much based, or religious there, studies, I should say, excuse me, is very much based yes. in this like move from we, structuralist we, to post-structuralist yeah. kind of thinking, where it's trying there to undo has, the play those pl spaces, and so I think it's interesting that you're applying that to yeah. games, but then there's also like this other layer of. The, like to add Deleuze to it is really interesting to me. We we start there as like modern religious studies scholars with a guy named Jay Z Smith, and yep. so mm -hmm. you know anyone that's mm -hmm. interested in imagining religion, which is the the great book and the introduction, where he just makes mm -hmm. up front we as scholars create the category of religion, yeah, of which to study, right? Even before that, yes. it arises in you know a, a colonialist missionary period, right, mm -hmm. um, of trying to denote. Hey, there's this Christianity thing, and there's also not Christianity. It's like things like Christianity, whatever. Um, go go and You're... look up the early like missionaries to uh, Tibet, and they refer to it as Lamaism, and they re they they the the Christians, the missionaries, uh, process it as a wacky form of Catholicism that the Dalai Lama is a pope, right? This is so, so fascinating. And so because... it, it, they're they're using right their their preconceived notions to then understand and filter other religious traditions, right? And mm -hmm. so that's where religious study, that's where, sorry, that's where religion as a category is made. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so Jay-Z Smith is like, we're not going to fall on the sword defending this thing. It is a constructed category. Lean into that. You as scholarly man, right? Put mm -hmm. on your, your superhero outfit and you designate what is religion as you study it. This is right. so cool that I've re yeah I remember I've read some Jay Z Smith too because and comp studies were constantly what comparative studies everybody like asks me what the hell comparative studies is and it's really just this like looking into the formation of knowledge through a lens of comparison right because usually knowledge is formed by comparing something to something else and saying that yeah. is or is not like another but even yeah. just to compare one to another thing is a colonial framework because that is largely like what the bent of philosophy uh, at least in ser in terms of like academic study is about so how do we form categorizations and how do those categorizations um relate to other 
uh, relate to and limit other kinds of thinking and emergent forms of communication and expression. So I think that this is such a fun like application to something that's really part of people's everyday experience, like across. I don't know. I like now. It's a very like now and twentieth to twentieth twenty first century kind of relationship that people have to playing games. I know that they've existed for much longer, but because the production has been able to increase so much in the last like hundred years, people are so deeply engaged with them all the time in very different ways that do and do not relate to religion. Like I would be interested to hear about what you think happens. Like for family home evening for people who are part of the LDS religion or are Mormons, like they have days designated to play board games together that are not related to religious practice, but in this interesting like metaphor or kind of relationship. That Wait, is that real? Is that true? Play- yes. That explains everything. <laughs> Holy I'm shit. So, like I'm so, I mean, the family home evening is more than just playing board and games also, together but that's what if you're telling me a lot of a lot of anyway, lds people play board games at family home evening that explains all, yeah. a lot of board oh game nights God. i've been I, to william yeah. jump in yes please just uh just <laughs> vouch for why do you need folklore in this in when you study religion right oh yeah and so yeah, the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. The way you just yes. said it of like the board games doesn't make sense in a religious framework or it's independence of religious framework right mm-hmm. and they vaguely associated with your use of religion in that sentence is the institution right (laughs) so it's a form of institutional reinforcements right and you know if if human nature is by nature local communal and informal it takes institutional resources to standardize it right yes to (laughs) make it doctrine to make it Mm -hmm. you know whatever right Uh, a legacy culture whatever Mm -hmm. it is right Mm -hmm. And so yeah, by its own true. nature, especially as those that study religion, we work really hard to not reify, right? Whenever mm-hmm. we study religion, that we only look at the elitism, that we only look at the institution, we only look at those that have cultural power. Yeah. Because on the ground, the vernacular of religion, the lived religion, the folk religion, right, is something that needs to be studied more and is usually left out of the conversation. Does rest, that make sense? Rest in peace, yeah, Leonard Premiano. Absolutely. You would have loved this stream. I know. <laughs> Leonard Premiano, you would have loved this stream so much. I have your pin. I'm wearing it to AFS. Like, oh, you are not. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I actually um, you know, I never, I was never able to meet him in person, but uh, he was, you know, reviewing my materials and we were in dialogue before he oh. died. Oh, um, amazing. And yeah. I'm actually, I'm also a part of the edited volume that's the last thing he was working on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last thing he was working on was on vernacular Catholicism, mm-hmm. and yeah. my my exorcism stuff fits into that volume. Perfect, so, yeah. Well, yeah. Wait, can well, you all believe we've literally only asked one question? No, we've asked two. We asked two. We started. <laughs> well, we, we started asked, with a later question two, because it was still, about board games. We got that off. I didn't want to bury that because I didn't want to bury that. But let's talk about exorcisms while you bring it up. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, last year, live at AFS, uh, you and I talked a lot about exorcisms. This is the first. It was the first interview from live at AFS to really start going off the rails. We did not stick to the time frame, um, <laughs> and uh, you mentioned that they were uh, difficult to document. What are some of the research challenges you had in researching exorcisms for your dissertation? Um, the fact that if they were behind closed doors, right? It, it, you, it would help if you have like consent approval from the recipients of the exorcism, right? Mm-hmm. That also, even if you even if you just observe them, but even if you're uh, just in their presence, but especially also if you interview them, that is a IRB nightmare. Oh my right? God. Oh, I because there's, there's, oh my so, God. there's so many red flags of how soon after are you talking to them, right? Are they still under duress? Are they still, you know, impacted by this the emotional stress of what just happened to them? Yeah. Right. And so, as such, you're kind of stuck with things that are happening in public, right? In order, in terms of documentation, right? Um, also, you know, even if you go off of like practitioners of how many exorcisms are you performing, right? Practitioners are not even if they're embedded in each other's networks. They're, they're getting better. There's now, like, I went to an exorcist convention, right, uh, th- where they they 
came together and talked shop and gave ideas to each other and such. But uh, those things are rising, both for Catholic circles and, and you know, evangelical ones. Uh, but by and large, it is not a well uh, cohesive community that they immediately know of each other. Mm. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. They may, know, they may know of each other, but not so in direct contact that they know of each other's dealings and have, you know, stats on that kind of stuff. And so instead, what you, yeah. what you end up tracking is what is the folklore that travels within these circles, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, for instance, um, one of the things that I was covering uh, when I was writing on this stuff was uh, kind of like, uh, what, what's a good word of like, like hesitant, um, precautionary tales, right? Mm, mm-hmm. And so... I heard the same similar type of folktale, right? Or not not the same and similar, but I heard a similar folktale among different priests and the priest exorcists, that is, of, for instance, a, you know, middle-aged woman that gets into new age, goes into a new age bookstore or some antiqu- antiquity shop and gets what seemingly is an innocent looking item that you don't actually know has been cursed in some way or affiliated with dark magic yeah. or you know, non-Christian occultism or religiosity, iconography, or even if it's not, you know, outwardly Hindu or Buddhist, it's a beautiful swan, but underneath it is, you know, a satanic altar, you know, hidden within the swan, right? And so it's a sort of like unknowing gateway, right? That as you're drifting away from religious practice or proper religious practice in the sense of Catholic Christians, exactly. And you're drifting into what is heterodox, what is deviant, right? That you're unknowingly opening doors for evil entities to enter your home, right? That that similar type of folktale I have heard from multiple priests, right? That is itself really interesting. One, it's clearly gendered, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the woman that's going and seeking, right, uh, for the New Age bookstore, but also, you know, be careful of drifting so far from tradition and, you know, it's also like pornography. It's also like potentially accidental, which yes. I think is interesting. Like it's eh, potentially it's not. Your, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I would get. I would guess it would depend on the tale or the person or whatever. No, it's but. it's it's out there. It's just, uh, are you wearing your spiritual armor today? Because it's gonna get you. <laughs> yeah, it's a little. I mean, are maybe accidental. Are, are you Harry uh, Potter fan? Complicated well, question. Com- complicated. I did not grow but... up reading Harry Potter. <laughs> oh. Um, there's a aware of Harry Potter. I am aware of Harry Potter. Yes. (laughs) There's, there's one, there's one character, uh, named Mad-Eye Moody. Yes. Like the fourth film. Mm -hmm. I'll explain why I'm bringing this up, but in short, he has a phrase called constant vigilance. Oh yeah. Yeah. Never made it into the films, but, uh, like always be on guard. Right. Because he's, he's, he's at that point, he's the defense against the dark arts teacher. Also, mm-hmm. if I hope to one day teach Defense Against the Dark Arts as a class, it totally I belongs mean, in religious studies. You're already um, de- like you're well on yeah. your way. <laughs> yes, and so I, think I took a sacraments class in high school that I think was basically Defense Against the Dark Arts. But go on. I mean, I mean, yeah. Ah, uh, just to be clear, uh, exorcism historically and famously is not a sacrament. It's not a sacrament. It is, it is a sacramental. Yep. Would you like to know why? I know. Uh, yeah. Catholics want sacraments to have 100% efficacy, mm-hmm. right? If you do holy orders, if you do matrimony, if you do communion, if you do reconciliation, any of these, the anointing of the sick, right? No, there's no way in which it didn't, it, it didn't, it wasn't successful that you were not brought closer to God. Yeah. Sacramentals can fail. Mm-hmm. Exorcisms can fail. I see. Yeah. Interesting. Anywho, my brother but, was in a coma. Yeah. He got he got uh, he got uh, anointing the sick and lived. So mm. yeah. And so <laughs> po- point of all that is that you know this constant vigilance thing of always be on guard because dark entities are trying to get to you. That's right. Right. Is a is a real fun religion of fear. You know, type of, of fun. Of, uh, Psy- psycho, psycho- very ex- it is fun. Stimu- but, stimulating uh, and exciting and psychogeography. Uh, another fun word, right? Yeah. Of how you orient space and how you react to space. Um, there was my, I was having dinner with like my dad and his wife and their granddaughter. And she, I actually don't know how old they are now. How old she is now, but let's say she was like, 
you know, 10 or 12 or something. And she knows that I was getting a PhD and she knows that I study religion, but didn't really know much more than that. And so at that age, she asked, hey, what, what do you what do you focus on, study, whatever? And I was like, you've been reading Harry Potter, yes? And she's like, yeah. What book are you on? Goblet of Fire. I was like, great. Have you met Mad-Eye Moody? And she said, <laughs> yes. And I was like, so he's a, famously, he's a dark wizard catcher. Yeah. ex horror, right? And so there are those things that go bump in the night. And guys like him exist and gals that go and confront the evil and either kill them or try and imprison them in Azkaban, right? And so those things, this is a famous Hellboy line if you're a Hellboy fan. There are those things that go bump in the night and we bump back. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that is what his job is as an Auror, or it was when he was. Um, and so I told her, I study the equivalent of a dark wizard catcher in real life that's called an exorcist and it was funny because she says but they're not real right and i was like or are they and the whole point is whether or not demons exist ghosts exist spirits any of these things right at a metaphysical level at a supernatural one whether or not those things exist throw it out the door people like mad eye moody exist and that's yeah. what i study and that's who i study Let's let's. I want, I want yeah, you to talk a little bit more, if I can, about about that. psycho uh, geography, because uh, I think it's very interesting how you tie in sense of place to study of uh, religion and exorcism. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Psycho geography. I think his name is Deary, Mark Deary. Um, did you ever did you ever read up on like uh, Afrofuturism? There's a great yeah. article called Black to the Future. Mm, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, psycho geography is used to denote. What does it mean for a black man to be in a hostile anti-black environment? And the way that he denotes it is a stranger in a strange land. Yep. Right. It's that it's if for any of you that have seen Get Out. Right. Mm -hmm. Why does it always feel as if you're in a horror movie because you're a black man alone at a wealthy elite white gathering? Right. Where he's he doesn't know it, but he's being auctioned off to the highest bidder. Right. Mm -hmm. And so. The, that uneasy feeling that this, I don't feel welcomed, right? Or I don't feel like this environment is, you know, actually has my best interests or is friendly to me. Or safe. Right? Or safe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so um, we, for instance, like at UCSB, there was a guy that was like consistently trying to kidnap women like last year um, mm -hmm. at, at UCSB's campus. And they eventually caught him. But for that reason... If you were a, a lone woman on campus, the psychogeography of being in that area is very different, right? Than if you're someone else that is not a attracting the same type of guy and male gaze and, and so forth, right? And so the, the way in which psychogeography functions is the way I'm oriented in space, how it treats me and how I interact with it, right? And so it's not just for institutional racism or sexism or hostile forces, but it shows to go back to video games, there's an interaction at play. I can impact the game and the game can impact me. Right. Mm -hmm. We saw so, that we played Doki Doki literature club. Um, <laughs> yeah. Great example of that. I think actually of a video game crossing the psychogeography where, where it, it is a contained, well, you like to think, that video games are contained in cyberspace, whatever that means to you, um, or into the console or into the the sphere, but then that they really do work on you. And that's just a really good example of the intensity of that, of something we've played on the show. But other RPGs are like that too. I mean. They're great. Yeah. Um, they've, they've ceased making content, at least gaming content, but um, do y'all know Red Letter Media? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, yeah. I was Grant watching them before the show, it, yeah. Previously recorded. Previously so recorded. Good. Yeah. Right. They mm -hmm. they basically go and watch like their last you know stream where they say why they're canceling or not canceling why they're ceasing it because they feel like they're just a broken record that are making the same complaints about modern games and they again back to the normative they want games to be a certain way and just modern AAA titles aren't doing it and so um, one of the arguments that Rich Evans makes when when talking about you know. Uh, first person shooters especially massive multiplayer online ones like call of duty or whatever is that they punish beginners right you are right. airlifted oh into this large map and here's all these experienced players that outside of even hacking because that even happens too outside of that 
you have well-experienced players that not only have the skills, they are awarded with better armor, with better weapons, with better skill, with, you know, better capabilities, etc. And so it is punishing beginners, right? It doesn't make you feel empowered. It makes you feel, you know, unwelcome I... and hostile to you. And that is a psychogeography of games, of certain type of games. Oh, my God. Um, David, who's been on the show before a couple times and famously helped us with doing RPG stuff, used to play ARK online and has a wonderful story about being kidnapped by people and harvested um, as a single lone player uh, for materials being just like yeah, basically bloodlet in a, in a <laughs> getting knocked out the character getting knocked out waking up in a cage and being bloodlet and forced to eat um until basically the character like trigger warning graphic content um had to basically eat his own feces in the game to poison himself to die so he could restart somewhere else because a character this like team of people just completely punished this lone player like no questions at wild wild okay daisy so, has that example i was just thinking play. about how mad i get when i play elden ring but go on william <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Elden Ring is a fun example too of of a more uh, what I have seen as a more positive relationship where people are actually leaving f jokes for you. Yes, that is true. Um, I mean, there's at you least finger. more give and take. <laughs> Arc is a little bit more um, dark in that sense, or kind yeah. of like vicious, vicious uh, to new players. But that's a those are just some examples of of this huge category of games. Anyway, yeah. You've seen the gaming syllabus that I sent you. One of the things that uh -huh. I cover, it's on um, Halloween, actually, because Halloween falls on a Monday and I have class then. That's right. Uh, on Halloween on Monday, we're covering Friday 13th, the game, if you know. Yes. Uh -huh. And that is one, the psychogeography, if you are alone and uncoordinated with the other seven counselors, right? Mm -hmm. Or six, however many it is, mm -hmm. right? Um, you the psychogeography of being hunted by Jason or trying to get out is very different, right? Of of trying to withstand the 20 minutes or get to the cops or whatever, signal for help, versus when you go in with a bunch of buddies and your goal is to either just beat Jason with bats or try and kill him, and people do get successful with this, even though it's really hard to do, right? The psychogeography is so different when there's strength in numbers, right? Even though there's asymmetric gameplay based on the coordination that you have with others or experience or whatever else, you can alter the your experience of the game and how you feel within it. Have you ever played Until Dawn? No, which one's that one? Oh Until my Dawn. god. Okay, talk about okay. Is it Until also Dawn. a survivalist game? No, okay, I only have played it in groups with people because it's the best way to play it. It's basically a horror game where it's a walkthrough horror game where it's sort of point and click and then there's some like reaction. There's like big um, actors, yeah. Yeah, but there's like Remy Malik is in it, uh, but there's a number of big actors who are in it. Um, but basically, it's a horror movie that you and your team are kind of figuring out together. And I've only ever played it with like five or six people sitting behind the person with the controller telling them what choices to make. And it has a sort of butterfly effect model. That's the kind of storytelling model that they use where certain choices you make affect later gameplay. And there are like hundreds of different outcomes for who lives and who dies. Everyone can live. There's a way to do that. But more often than not, you get a mix of people who live and die based on your choices. And it's a fascinating game. It has a ton of great folklore. I'm not going to spoil it because um, it's a great Halloween game if you want to play it. You can play it in about two sessions with people if you want. But that's a game where, like, the it, you're not watching the horror. You're watching a horror movie and you're going, don't go in there, don't go in there, don't go in there. Except you can actually not go in there <laughs> if you want, which is amazing. Um and like that's so cool to give that kind of like agency into the game and it makes your heart beat faster and like so i have some friends who won't play it because it's too much oh my god anyway Absolutely. yes daisy do you think uh one more serious question or should we go into the fun questions at this point let me, look at, the, let me look at where we are is it in, inside okay. the actor's studio when it's like what is your favorite this... word we've actually asked that to okay. a guest and her answer was <laughs> bitch so there you are yeah. <laughs> um that is it's a good question uh hey, can i answer little, can i be a little long yeah uh well, well yeah. what is your favorite word 
What's your favorite Hold word? on, I have a whole I have a whole startup thing I have to do for this. All right. And we're back with Inside of the Folk uh, Folkwise Studio. I'm Dom Lipton. William, what is your what is your favorite word? Equipment. Ooh. Uh, what do you Explain. want God to say to you when you get to heaven? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, what if they say equipment? But hold oh. on. Oh my god. Hold on. So just real quick, not only do I love the sound of it, the equi, you know, uh, equi, it's yeah. just it's just great. You know, as a strange combination of sounds. But uh, for any of you, I know that you know there's there's a whole uh, backlash of, of citing you know a philosopher like Heidegger given the Nazism and other things. But there's a really pronounced Heideggerian scholar uh, on my campus that kind of indoctrinates us into into using the theory. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that is good that comes out of Heidegger is this notion of equipment that it is not it, it's a totalizing mindset, right? It's not just that I pick up the hammer and use the hammer or the keyboard or the computer, right? There's a totalizing act, uh, mindset that it offers it, you know, so right. ready, ready to hand, right? If you give someone, a, a, like, for instance, I, I grew up with PC. I was st- I'm still mostly foreign to, to Apple products. If you give me the Mac, which I was using my wife's, I was like, I understand this is a computer. I, I don't know what is going on. I don't know where things are. Yep. Right. It's just a hunk of junk to me because I can't actually make it do something. And that happens a lot in games too, right? Where you're given the controller, I see the avatar, I know what I'm I know what I should be doing. But unless I can access it, right? Unless I have the mindset that unlocks all those possibilities, I have a very limited ex- relationship with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so equipment is not just the the tool, but it is a accompanying you know not just habitus but framework of which i can utilize the tool to my you know emerging game player liking all right yeah. uh, mango oh. the the melee great uh, i once saw him on stream say the first thing he does whenever he touches a video game is figure out every movement option and then he figures out if he's going to keep playing the game <laughs> right yeah. yeah you're 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 investigating the realm of the possible yeah in in a religious studies terms that is cosmology Right? That's right. Yeah. What is the not just the order of the world, but what is the realm of the possible? Right. Mm-hmm. And so oh at gosh, any yeah. at any given time, I'm I'm looking for what is the cosmology afforded to me in this game or available to me in this game without hacking. So Daisy, this this question here, I I'm going I'm going to say I'm going to save that for when uh, William is on live at AFS this year. Come by. Uh, That's really come, good. Come That's by Saturday true. night, and this will be great. this will be what we'll talk about. That's <laughs> it. Yep. It'll be the session. Yep. But let's get into some fun. Let's get into some fun, fun questions while we're already at it. Uh, I am gonna keep doing inside the Folkwise Studio, oh and I'm gonna play. A, okay. We're we're gonna do a little word association. I'm gonna name a fighting game franchise, and you tell me who your favorite character is. You ready? Yes. All right. Street... If, if I if I've played it, I hope you have. Sure. Uh, Street Fighter. Uh, I switch, but. I'll go with Dalsim. Okay. Uh, Mortal Kombat. But also Baraka's. Um, Blaka, sorry. Um, Mortal Kombat. Uh, I am a Kung Lao player, but outside of that, um, I would say consistently game to game, uh, Reptile. Ooh, Smash. Ooh. Game and Watch, but also D to D. Tekken. Yoshimitsu. Uh, Soul Calibur. Yoshi Bits is okay. also in that one. <laughs> and, uh, and Guilty Gear. So I haven't played Guilty Gear. Ah, oh, oh, hold on, William. William, as a religious studies scholar and a fighting game player, Guilty Gear is extremely up your alley. That's what I've been told. Yeah. Um. Um. Going, yeah. I'll name one. I'll name one. Uh, I'll name one for you. I think. I think you're gonna play uh, Leo White Fang. Uh, <laughs> no, Faust. 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 He's the most game and watch, and he kind of moves like Santa Claus in uh, Fight of the Gods. I also say one that I don't anticipate because again, now it's now it's just like what have I played? Oh, this is and the end of the what, list. What are you gonna say? <laughs> I don't think you were gonna ask me that. I have played a lot. Was have you ever played the Naruto? Uh, like Ultimate Ninja Storm games no. like Shippuden. They're like it's if you're I'm not really a big Naruto fan. I like the world of it. I just again haven't committed to the anime. Mm-hmm. But 
the plethora of characters available in the Naruto fighting games. You can also have like two sidekicks that do like assist, assists, yeah, assist oh, moves cool. and stuff. That's cool. Um, and it's so much fun. And so at any time you're playing with three characters that are all doing we- really weird, wacky things. And so, and you know, there's n- there's a Naruto where you can turn into the nine tailed fox, the fire fox. There's I've seen that. One yeah. where he can make he can make copies of himself. Right. There's there's all sorts of really fun, interesting gimmicks and fighting mechanics uh, in that game that uh, I'm a huge fan of. Okay, I got two more to ask you now that you've mentioned that. Two more to ask you, and then we'll move on to the next question. Dragon Ball Fighters. Um, I haven't played Fighters. I haven't. I haven't played since Budokai. Who you um, played Budokai? Because of the Dalsim bit, it was Piccolo. It's Piccolo. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes. And uh, and and last one, uh, because you mentioned two assists, Marvel versus Capcom. Mega Man. Hell yes. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah, Great yeah. answer. All right. Yeah. Uh, next one. Next one. This came up last year at AFS, but I want you to say it it's now. Also, which is also funny because I don't really play Mega Man in Smash. Um, He's way I, different. I, I He's do. way different. He, yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Uh, this came up last year at AFS, but I want you to say it again for the record uh, for, for this like for this YouTube video that people are watching. Uh, sell us on UCSB changing their mascot to the Mapaches. <laughs> Yes. So again, also the vernacular, right? Religion, like culture, right? Mm-hmm. We, like go and go and look up, for instance, like the history of Marian devotion. Yeah. And by that, I mean like so, like Virgin Mary, you know, work and 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 worship, right? Is something that rose up as a populist movement that was later, you know, appropriated by the institution, right? In order to keep their followers Catholic, which is really fun, and so. No way in hell that the raccoon, you know, cult has uh, grown to such, <laughs> you know, large estate that they've gotten rid of the gaucho. But also, just make, just put the gaucho get up on a raccoon, and it's just as good. Honestly, but it's please better. Put the, put the gaucho get up on a raccoon. On a raccoon. <laughs> shouts out to shouts oh out to God. Bubbly Like Soda in chat who got me this raccoon yeah. when she heard I was sick. Yeah. And so it's like just just a piece of, just sell a shirt. Sell a shirt of a of a raccoon wearing the gaucho get up. Yes. And everyone will be happy. But um anywho, yeah, so our campus it's actually gone surprisingly, it's gone down in COVID times. I'm not sure why. Maybe there's less trash. Is that mm, is that a could good be. could be. Is that a thing? Right? Yeah, maybe think, since I, there's less you're onto something. maybe there's less maybe there's less trash and food on campus and now there's less raccoons. But mm-hmm. anywho, for a time, the campus was overrun by, you know, cute, cute, cuddly, you know, oh, furries. Oh, you truly and, love to see it. And, uh, you know, I've been surprised many times going to throw something in the trash. And unbeknownst to me, there's a raccoon just chilling out on top of it or like, you know, behind it. And like, clearly I'm, you know, in the wrong disrupting his home. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like the, the gaucho... It's okay as in the name. The if you Google it, I've said this before, it looks like Mr. Slave from South Park crossed with the hamburger. Um, and it's just not as fun. It's okay. And so I it's just not impressed, especially as Santa Cruz has the banana slug, which is far you know more so impressive. Cool. Yes, no known predators. No known predators. Yes. That sell shirts that say slug life. Slug right? life, yeah. It's amazing. And so we could be that cool. And so there would be something so much more fun and homegrown about the raccoon mascot. It's not going to happen. But uh, it would be dare, dare to I'm dream. I'm sold. I'm sold. I'm so- okay. oh, you, know what? You, you ain't got to tell me twice. Also, yeah, have fun watching this back when you see all the shenanigans that are happening on my the, end. The problem with, like, just not even UCSB. This is just a problem with school in general. I, I, I talk to my students, and they're like, fourth year is talking about how they're going to take a gap year and they say these words to me that i'm going to focus on me and i say what have you been doing for four years (laughs) right like who have you been living for right like is it are all of you are all of you being forced to be lawyers and doctors from your parents like none of you have chosen what the hell you want to study or what the hell you do anything else (laughs) right Mm -hmm. and so they don't get they don't get to be for them how how have you not how have you not been living for yourself? And the problem is, is that school often is is hard. Same like a job, especially if it's a job you don't like. 
it's hard for them to see it as an extension of themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so here's a populist movement that has arise that has arisen. And just one of the ways in which you can build morale, that you can have them be attached to the community, attached to this institution, just as a small little, you know, insignia of a raccoon, right? Our lady of the trash can. You could go, it could go a long way to have them be more ingrained, you know, with this universe in the same way that what is the Emory one? Um, uh, do, uh, Dooley. Dooley. There yeah. you go. Right. That. Uh, can you imagine, can you imagine a gaucho raccoon mascot jumping on the trampoline to score the basket or something? So awesome. This like, come so on. Good. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, what's it called? Uh, gritty, right? For the yeah, flyer. gritty, yeah. gritty. Like, again, postmodern. It's a it's a constructed weird thing of a mascot. Just just do what you want to do, you know. <laughs> oh, um, William, you're from San Antonio. Yeah. What's one thing? Uh, what should San Antonio be known for that it's not? Uh, Google the. San Antonio Downtown Public Library. Ooh. Please Google it. Drop that in chat, Yeah. Um, the, the, so it is, it is done by a Hispanic artist, and there's actually a sister building at, at the Latino like, Cultural Center in Dallas, which is where my wife is from. If you look oh. at it, the colors are weird. The shape is weird. It is a fantastic structure. Again, just emergent gameplay of architecture. Um, it, <laughs> yeah, someone's this playing is, Minecraft this, in real life. <laughs> honestly, this is so cool. I'm looking at this. See, I mean, I dropped a link to the find, images, wow, but that is so cool. Daisy, can you like scroll down the Google images and see if you find the aerial? The view? no, the aerial shot's like the fifth image. It's so cool. Yeah, so yeah, that it's really it is, yeah, very. Hold on, very I can I can I can put this I can put this on stream actually. Yeah, can you put this on stream? I, I mean, will, here's I a this. here's a very direct link. It it looks to like an image. It's like a bunch of shelves that you like pulled yeah. out of you know a, a container store. Yeah, item or something. exactly. <laughs> yeah, cool? and I and I'm seeing that re- those really interesting planters on that that are almost like I'm I'm getting Animal Crossing vibes, but that's I'm getting I'm getting like a. <laughs> Like art in a dentist's office in 1995. That might have been. That, that's actually pretty Love appropriate. It. It's it's in the it's in the Selena movie. If you know. Oh, is Selena, it really? Oh yeah. Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. And it's it really is. funny in in the digesis, right? In in the narrative of the world of the film, right? In the film's digesis, uh, I think they say that it's like Mexico City. I oh no! Way. Do, yeah, I think they do and, say it's Mexico City, which is really and, funny. And it's yeah. like, yo, that there are there are not... the. De- there's the downtown public library this in San is, Antonio. <laughs> it's really yes. Funny. The, the building is enchilada red, apparently. Yes. And so that's, that's uh, in the folklore, it is referred to as the big enchilada. The big enchilada. <laughs> the big enchilada. That. I love it. And so as, as someone who is like, you know, like uh, common collective space of which to use, right? Like where I did, I had debate practice in school in high school at that establishment right i ate there with friends i gamed it with board games and card games with friends in this establishment right why because it's a public space for the community to make of it what they want it to and so for someone like me we I couldn't invite people in my home in my mom's home you know to, to play board games or to study or to do whatever you know we did it at the downtown public library and so i have a lot of history there it, it's done well for its people and the art is just, it speaks to the people that it serves. Well, speaking of uh, Big Enchilada, Daisy, you got to ask this last one. <laughs> Put that library on a flag. All right. Um, <laughs> I want you to say one nice thing to me about Cali Mex. Cali Mex? <laughs> cuisine. As opposed, as a, cuisine. <laughs> as opposed to Tex-Mex. <laughs> what is Cali Mex? Hold on. What's that? It's like this is Cali, is what you're saying? Cali, like California. Okay. Oh, I heard from... Kelly. Oh no. Oh, Kelly Green. No, California. Yeah, Cali Max. I heard. I heard. Max. I'm from Southern sorry, California. Sorry. You're a Southern California transplant. You grew up you're with Tex Mex. Yeah. I grew up with Cali Tex. You're Cali Max. <laughs> Jesus, Cali Max. What is one thing that you enjoy? One nice thing California. you can say in their face. <laughs> I know Tex Mex wins. 
Hold on. Just, <laughs> I already just know. as a disclaimer, just as a disclaimer, my like I'm I'm you know a horrible you know uh, what is it uh, a simulated Tex-Mex identity, whereas my <laughs> wife is much more recently you know Mexican with her family, mm -hmm. and so I my my joke is you know my Mexican ass wife would say that we're both wrong that we're both inferior. Yeah. Yeah, that you know well, that is the truth. No, I, and my my and old roommate, my old roommate's from Sonora, it. so I've heard this a lot. <laughs> yes, and so I mean, I am biased. I I like the Tex Mex stuff, and but the the dabs and the jokes are true. Like you know, one of her, yeah. my, my brother in law, one of hers on her side says, if you wanted to make it Tex Mex, just put ground beef and cheese on it. Um, and he's not wrong. That What's the is problem? <laughs> That that does represent a lot of what goes on with Tex Mex food, but uh, yeah. So for instance, like I'll tell you of a brown of a brown man, but not just any brown man, a Texas transplant, right? Trying to find good tamales in California, right? California tamales are oddly big. They're just full of dough and the it's masa true. with very little meat inside of it, and it's dry and it's just it's, it's terrible. And so. Where I'm from, the mall is a much thinner, much more packed in terms of, you know, the distribution of the meat contents yeah. versus the dough. Yeah you, also, eat, uh, yeah, you eat like three or four of them. You don't eat like one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's and, such a good point. Yeah. To be clear, also, it's not just meat. You can have like bean and cheese. Meat, veggies or, and stuff, yeah. Or, yeah, and I'm I have not tried honest. them. But my, my wife says that uh, in Mexico, they also do sweet tamales. And so, like strawberries and that kind of stuff, Ooh. which to me, it's just like, what? Where's where's the beef? Have you but... been? Have you been to the strawberry festival in Oxnard? No, not yet. Con consider going. It's not. I mean, it's just like kind of any huge food festival, but I'm pretty sure that they have um, strawberry tamales. Yeah, this it's is cool. very I funny. How the <laughs> how the question was say one nice thing about. <laughs> About Cali Mex food, and so far you have said that tamales in Texas are better, <laughs> and that we're both inferior to Mexico. To Mexico, cuisine. okay, yes. cool. I can but hold on. So, yeah, I think that's on. totally so can fair. I say, hold on, can I say something nice? Um, <laughs> the Calif Hold on, wait, wait, wait. I will say something nice. The California burrito. Do you know what a California burrito? This is? came yeah. up. This came up uh, earlier last month. This came up last month. <laughs> California burrito, yes. they, they put basically French fries in a burrito with whatever you want. It yeah. actually makes a difference. It's actually very good. This Yeah, yeah. we had uh, uh, Louis <laughs> Lima. There's, there's your at, nice uh, thing. Where, where's Louis Lima at? Uh, San Diego. But where, San does Diego. where does yeah. he teach? This oh. came up for Louis Lima's episode last month. <laughs> does he teach at Loyola? Oh, I don't think so Marymount? you're just gonna you're just gonna keep asking until we say nice things yes basically no but he's <laughs> he teaches, but he's he from san diego at UC, he, he teaches at right, ucsd um, right U, Isn't that a school? ucsd yeah he teaches at ucsd but yeah he uh uh defended uh, the california burrito yeah. which daisy called the san diego burrito the san him. diego burrito and he was like <laughs> no you're wrong <laughs> i was like okay well i haven't been there in a while so <laughs> Hell yeah. I, yeah, I really miss people giving me tamales that they made at home. <laughs> oh, I might make some more. I've made tamales before. Maybe I should make some for Christmas. There was I miss, one, them. I miss my Christmas tamales. There was one little old lady on Saturdays who would roll up to the health food store in Bloomington and sell tamales out of the back of her truck. They were so good. Yeah. I. Uh, there's a, there's a place like, so I don't know if y'all know this. I, I do don't drink. I don't drink. I don't consume alcohol uh, for no interesting reason, just, you know, other than taste and other things. But um, and I'm cool with people that do drink. You know, I just I'll watch you drink. Uh, I'll just drink cranberry juice or whatever the hell the bar is offering. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I never used to frequent drinks. A nice little cherry. <laughs> yeah. And so I never I never used to frequent bars. But as a graduate student, part of the culture is to go and, you know, lament about our life choices. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so i started attending bars more and that's where i know about like which which bars in santa barbara have the best juice and so there is a place that that my department really loves going to and across the street late at night they sell tamales um like it's a it's like a regular you know mexican restaurant but mm -hmm. at night is when they bust out the tamales for the drunkards across the street and so oh, i yeah, go brother. and buy it right 
And I go and try it, and I'm like, this is drunk food. This is terrible. And I yes. am I am too sober. I'm very sober. <laughs> yes, I am, like, I am too many years sober to, uh, <laughs> to, Hell yeah. to, to be exploited and, and take my money and give me the bad food. Uh, that's awesome. Yes, yeah, so I was like, this is terrible. Where is that? What part of Santa Barbara? Uh, it's called, it's called um, I think it's Goleta, but it's old, it might be Old Town. Um, so it's it's like okay. the, the, there's two of them that's called the Mercury and the Imperial, and I for, they're owned mm-hmm. by they were owned by the same uh, person, and so I forget which is which, but the one across the street is I think it's the Mercury. That's um, awesome. But it might be the other one. But yes, and, and I actually don't even know what they're called. The restaurant. I surprise, surprise. Uh, I never went back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, now I'm getting all nostalgic about fun stuff to do in Santa Barbara. Like the fair and cascaronas. Yeah. Anyway, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, We've had hey, a lot of Californians that? recently on the show for you Recent. to talk about California we, shit, Daisy. We it's had been a great. lot of Utah people. We had a lot of Utah people, and then we had a lot of California people. And now I'm like, oh, I should visit home. But, yeah, but, <laughs> book, book some more people who can talk Ohio with me or something. Book some I'm Marylanders. Let's talk crabs. <laughs> I got some ideas. I got some ideas. Um. We you want to you wanna get in? You want to move boldly? You want to move boldly into yeah. this? Even though we're going a little over, you want to move boldly into the last segment? Yeah, I was gonna say. We've and William, the William, I'm having interview. so I'm having so much fun. I know we've this, okay. We are we are just <laughs> chopping it up. This is this is. I'm Do having you? so much fun listening. Can Will you come, you just on, just can come on the show almost? every? Yeah, can you just hang out with us? <laughs> I know we're gonna see you in a week, but like. Will you just, Let's, like, come on the come... back half of the show and play games with us? Yeah, and just, you just like, want to show up next time I we want... play Melee or something? <laughs> I need to... I I am current... As a pr- grad student who's currently working on my disc, hey, can we, like, talk about some stuff? Oh, yeah, you want to be Daisy's friend? <laughs> I sent her... I... I sent her a friend request on Discord, and so yeah. I, I, take, I take my friends oh, seriously. Dis- oh, the Discord friend request. You don't need you don't <laughs> oh need God. the friend request to chat, but yeah. What's the what's the Ike line from Smash? It's like I fight for I my fight, friends. I fight, I fight yeah. for my friends. Which is also yeah. what uh, what Marth says in uh, in Japanese, from what I understand. But um, yes. yeah, There's chat. If you got uh, chat, chat is loving also. you. Chat is yeah, loving death, you. If you've got any questions for William, chat that. send them, post them. Yeah. Please do. Uh, we I, can we I, have can officially. I, oh, can, I, can I ask a question to y'all? So, wow! Oh my God. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So, so basically, it's the question is like, am I insane or not? Um, oh. but not, yeah. not about yeah. this, but uh-huh. so, I love did, this question because I have no answer to <laughs> myself for the same question. It, yeah. Okay. Let's so, go. Yeah. So, uh, y- y- y'all yes. both saw. I sent you before this the the gaming syllabus. Yep. Right? Yes. Did you notice the XP system? I didn't there quite is... under. I saw that, but I didn't understand what that was. So there's no. There's only one mandatory assignment, and the rest of it is according to how much experience points that you want to generate from different activities. And so, that if is you so fucking cool. Yeah, so you get certain XP just by attending class. There's also kind of like a Discord chat, but we have our own app at UCSB called Nectar. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. if you want to do like crowdsourcing um, conversation outside of class, yeah. you get so many points for doing that. And then every assignment, if you want to do an ethnography of there's two parts. One of them is uh, arcade game culture, which we have documentaries that I'm assigning. There's another one if you want to do ethnography of in-person gaming or online communities of play and write a report on it, you get so many points for that. If you want to engage game theory, if you want to play a game, either listed in the syllabus or not, you get points for that, right? And so there's there's a, eventually we go over like Twitch plays Pokemon and there's like a data science section of the class that we get into. If you want to write a report on data science of in-game, you know, in-game choices of, you know, uh, crowd-based games, you can do the, an assignment on that. If you want to um, pitch your own game proposal, you get points for that. If you want to construct DLC for a game that already exists, you get points for that. And so the point is, is there's only one mandatory assignment, and I can say what that is later, but everything else is, you know, a choose your own adventure, as it were, right? Where I allow for emergent gameplay. I allow for non-linearity of what you want the class to be. 
And if you want to do single player, single player campaign, if you want to do multiplayer, you can do that too. And so I'm here for it, but it's, it's very, this is the first time I've taught it and it's very experimental. And so this is the pilot, you know, study of it all. But what are your thoughts on this weird structure? I, I want to talk pedagogy with you because I have a similar interest in doing that for an intro to folklore class because of how heavily it is related to like everyday creative expressions. And I would love to do something that emphasizes the the personal experience of doing those things in a way that isn't that is distinctly not and also hopefully pushes against the kind of archival model yes. of interviewing and stuff like that because i i find that dated and oh, frustrating that's, that's for a number of assignment. reasons but mm -hmm. that's another assignment if you want to do like a discourse analysis of games of what are, what are, what does the gaming community say about that game right um and so uh for instance one of them one of my students is doing a report on i had never heard of the game geshen impact <laughs> and... you, okay you haven't People heard of Genshin impact <laughs> yeah, first of all you never heard of Genshin impact it's like the also... most popular game <laughs> until until <laughs> i met him yeah <laughs> and so the point was is there's, there's a, a character of... named tartalia like that I'm, I'm taking that personally <laughs> <laughs> so the point of it is that there's allegations of it you know ripping off breath of the wild right mm -hmm. and so Don't that's get me what started his... That's what his report is going to be on. It right? is more That's fun so than cool. it is. It is more fun people's... than Breath of the Wild. It is Breath of the Wild, but, but not an empty void of, of 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 vegetables or whatever Breath of the Wild is. Right. But the point is, is that that's, you know, engaging no, what is the I, community saying about a game, right? Is, is, I, was gonna, that's I feel like it. I need to explain myself. I feel like I need to explain myself. Genshin okay. Impact is all the things I miss about Zelda and all the things I miss about Pokemon that both games don't do anymore. Sure. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I you're not you're not crazy, you're not anything even close to that. I think this is a really I'm very I, curious how it will end up. I mean, I mean maybe you're a little bit crazy, I am too. Well, I got can I, can I say something? I'm very curious how it's going to end up in practice and if your students are going to get the depth of application of the materials that you hope that yeah. they will achieve. Like that will be the interesting part to me. I'm thinking like as a teacher, but in principle, it sounds very cool. As long as students understand that you're trying to replicate the emergence that you are saying defines video games. Oh, also. So there's like, you know, there's 20 different assignments, right? Yeah. And there's a, there's like, a, there's also like a blank, like thing of question marks for a 21. And A21 is blank, and the whole point of it is for students to design their own assignment and propose it to me, something that I haven't predetermined. Sure. And then we'll talk about how much XP it is and when, what's the due date. But yeah. that is also me allowing for emergent gameplay, right? I have not predetermined all the pathways of success in this class. And so if mm -hmm. you can come up with another system, another assignment, another way to engage games that I haven't already put in the syllabus, I will allow for it and accept the emergent gameplay of it all. You've thought so hard about, like, staying I, on theme. I really respect I like, it. Also, yeah, I, have, I, like I, have to say, I have to say this. I have to say this because William might love or hate this, but the only class i have taken that sounds remotely like this was taught by father dave whalen sorry <laughs> you've replicated a priest anyway well that's funny <laughs> i i what was really the class like on yeah it was, was like on? my honors theology class in high school yeah well, how are you um, supposed to I, different ways of finding salvation exactly i like that also from like a teacher like a pedagogy perspective of putting the onus of learning on the students because i think students forget that like they are agents of their own learning like they they're so taught to like receive information and then make a connection and spit it out rather than design their own interests and take the agency in that role so you have done both put the work on them <laughs> for creating an assignment if they want to do that but not left them without support for doing that which i think is About really interesting life. too <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I get this is why I'm like, oh, you want to turn in an assignment um, that it, I don't have outlined? Well, write the rubric for me and I'll grade it for that. They never want to write the rubric. I don't think you're going to get many students who take you up on that option. I we'll like see. it. Exists, I think more of you, <laughs> explain, like if you explain the spirit in which it exists. But yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. 
I cannot tell you. Dom and I are exploding our brains Daisy, right now. Daisy, let her, Please. yeah, pull the trigger, let her rip. I, William? Uh-huh. Please click watch stream okay. <laughs> because you have created from this last, I don't know, however many minutes that was of providing context for your syllabus, <laughs> the best context for the game what? we are about to play together, <laughs> which is a tier list of games that you specifically <laughs> reference oh, wow. for a syllabus we would like you to rank them william have you ever made a tier list before uh not like this but okay hold on <laughs> rank according to what <laughs> to your own scale of of no, whatever <laughs> best Fine. interest will... personal personal favorite playability really whatever you get to also decide. i don't know how enforceable it is but if you're in williams class sorry sick williams <laughs> class and you fill this out and send it to him you get one point extra credit i don't know if you can enforce that but <laughs> i threw it in there <laughs> I mean, sure, right? um, yes okay. this isn't all the games on your syllabus because normally we like to take like keep these to nine or eleven titles to kind of get like encourage there's too many distribution there's too many but yeah. we tried to pick the greatest hits so daisy Perfect. Yeah, keep going. I, yeah, so a, a tier list, um, a tier list is is something that comes to fighting games where you used to rank yes. players of different abilities, oh, etc. It's, it's for the chat. Know. It's for the chat. It's we That's know you. You're you're, a, you're an FGC. We know, yeah, we know you sure. get it. But for the people in the chat who are watching, maybe for the first time, we see this on YouTube, trying to figure out what we're doing. You rank characters, video games, content, whatever on Twitch. Usually, people are ranking things beyond characters in fighting Omelet, games. Omelets, cereal, That's, fast food chains. That's vernacular culture, and this That's is right. a, a way to rank things of everyday life. So we <laughs> love to have our guests rank things that are particular to them in some kind of way uh, in everyday life. And we have brought to you games on William Chavez's Religion and Video Games class tier list, or uh, class syllabus, excuse me, William. Um, <laughs> ranking a syllabus from S rank D. from S to D. Yeah, Daisy. S <laughs> yeah, rank from S <laughs> Sorry, rank Pretty games no on your is. syllabus from S. Oh my god, I well let's S get it you, let's get into it <laughs> yeah s s superior god level beyond d is the worst trash you know you we can make it up we can make it double s we've done it in the past i don't we've done right, it i don't want to i don't want to say that it's trash but fine i'll you've you've convinced me to put it to c okay 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 <laughs> oh God, no, you can i mean we love a straight to d moment we love, we a, love a straight to d moment we love a, a striated a a big yes tier list. <laughs> Okay, so um, I believe that that's Sorcerer's Arena. Next oh, right here is Sorcerer's Fire Arena. Fire. Yeah, where's that going? Yes. D. You can put it. No, C. Uh, as in okay, C. C. Okay. So the reason it's in C, right? Because this is part of the wave of Disney mobile games. Yeah. Right. And so there's uh, what is it? Uh, battle, battle, or Heroes Battle Mode, right? And uh, Mirrorverse and so forth. And so. Uh, Disney is, and also like outside of mobile games, um, Disney Infinity. Oh, that was right? so huge. King Kingdom Hearts, and so it's it's really big, right? For how Disney is creating its, you know, multiverse of madness. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, as a game, as ludology, it's not that interesting. It's more interesting for the narratology of it, mm -hmm. right? Of the digesis, what thematic elements of it, right? what yeah. it means as a pop culture phenomenon, but it's not on the syllabus because it's an ama it has amazing game mechanics and gameplay. And so for that, it's so important, but uh, as, as I rate this, I'll put it at the C. You, you've saved it. Saved it. Next, let's move yeah. into... Uh, let's move into Fight, Fight of Gods. Gods. Let's Fight of Gods. I, just, I mean, it's, it's always been amazing. And just so that you know, the way that this came into my life, I had a me, class... I TA'd a class on uh, Dark Goddesses, Black Madonnas, which is a great, you oh. know, we have a scholar named Lisa Pettis here that's amazing. And that's her class of, you know, uh, you know, dark complected, you know, deities, both across the world, but also there's like Guadalupe and, and et cetera. There's different variations, you know, Chesahova of different dark skinned Marian apparitions. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we covered a lot of goddesses and I show them fight of gods. And as a class activity, 
there, I broke them up into groups, and the job was create DLC for Fight of Gods based on the goddesses that we're covering in class. That is awesome. I love it. Oh, so cool. <laughs> William, be our friend and stay on this show forever. <laughs> oh my god. So they created DLC at the time. It was, and this was what was amazing. It was, um, it was Kali. It was Isis, and it was uh, Tara. And so they created DLC for all of them. And then the next week, they had just dropped as a DLC Matsu, who we were covering in class. Whoa! And so in addition to, I don't know if you've ever seen like that, that taxonomy, the Bloom, like was it Bloomfield or whatever his name is, of like learning objectives in a class. But yeah. the, the, the top one is when you can evaluate something, right? Mm. And so <laughs> we then evaluated based on the readings, based on what you had learned, how, you know, effective and representative was the Batsu character design based on what we had learned in class. And so, oh my gosh, um, so there's, cool. there's so many things you can do with fight of gods. In addition to it being a funny indie game, um, I will move it to B. Okay. Okay. All right. Next up, we're shooting the devil here. It is doom Two. doom allows for great exploration and less handholding into what is, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and allows for a lot of like nonverbal, non-textual yeah. uh, tutorial of what exactly you should be doing in the game. And so it's very good at how it incentivizes certain play styles. It's very well articulated and designed. I will put it at A. Uh, oh, yeah. Next up, Friday the 13th, the game. Another indie tile that has a lot of bugs, and it is so good because people play it despite all the glitches. Be Again, they're the language. developers. The developers are doing more with less, and the Love the that. ways in which it's not just if you're a fan of the series, it is very faithful, you know, gamification um, of what's going on. Uh, but again, it also the way that it allows for emergent gameplay is just top tier. Um, I'm going to put it above Doom 2. In A tier? So it's, above Doom 2? It, it's it's A tier, but it's above Doom. Got it. Uh, next up is uh, Never Yield. Do y'all know of Never Yield? It's a, I, it's I'm a trying to find someone to play it on the stream with. I think it, it would be perfect. So it's, it's amazing just as, again, as an indie game, it's also about the struggle of a black game developer trying to make his way in the industry. It's allegoric of never yield, never cease, never give up, despite the obstacles that come. Um, it's also great with Afrofuturism stuff. A lot of great things are happening in it. The soundtrack is also amazing, which, you know, if you look at like playthroughs online, as you're playing and you hit an obstacle, yeah, you're bummed because you either died or you, you failed. But there's also this like rip track um, that, right, mm -hmm. that, that ruins the soundtrack. And yeah. so it's also oh, like so cool ruin the vibe right of yeah. the gameplay and so as you never yield the, the music keeps going as soon as you screw up then yeah and so also again great game design for you know doing get, like, so much with so little i want to get like fernando um, or ahuela on here to play that game oh like he like wrote cool. the ethnomusicology book about hip-hop he'd be perfect anyway yeah i will put it behind fight of gods okay okay uh, next up, I'm calling it like the original Mario trilogy, but you talked mainly about three, right? Yes. So, um, oh, the first six. Um, so the three Mario Brothers, uh, Super Mario World, and then the two on Game Boy of six golden coins and Wario Land. Wario, yeah. The only mandatory assignment in the entire class is there we to go. reverse. Yes, is to reverse engineer the game design of those six Mario games. You pick one. And I give you like the instruction manual and everything else, and you can watch gameplay. Act as if you are pitching it to the publishers at Nintendo. I have this game. This is how it works. This is the gameplay. This is how it incentivizes gamers. Whatever. This is what makes it distinct. These are, you know, what what's uh, uh, what it allows for pattern recognition or world mm -hmm. exploration. Mm. Whatever. And so the only mandatory assignment is someone has to deconstruct. Uh, one of those Super Mario games and pitch it as a proposal. And you learn a lot about game mechanics in the process. All right, I'm going to do um, it. I'm going to do it. First, take a lot of mushrooms and li start listening to Herbie Hancock. Okay, that's all I got. 
And so, um, it is the S tier. Hey! It's just incredible game design that still holds up um, over all these years. Uh, next up is MK Mortal Kombat. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make this in the same way that you chose like the original Mortal Co- the original Mario games. I'm gonna take this reflective of the franchise. Yeah, right? you're reflective of the franchise, but specifically you talk about one through four because they were the ones on arcade, right? Yes, but the yeah. whole point of the class is to see it's it's you know techno social gaming dynamics, right? Mm-hmm. How are we changing the way that we interact as groups based on changing technology and the field of play? And so mm-hmm. Mortal Kombat just by happenstance coincides with the evolution of gaming social like socialization yeah, there it so is talk to me it, it, is, <laughs> it is it comes off at the tail end of the arcade experience in the 90s it then moves to home console it then moves to online competitive play right yep. and so by studying the mortal Kombat franchise you can study how we are changing the way that we interact with each other while playing games um as a fighting game it allows there's it has a an elaborate story so you can play the story if you like it it has a world of characters weird cults like melina fans there's like you know the way that it, it is you know uh gamifying hyper masculine aggressive culture <laughs> with fatalities and gore the sensationalism of video game violence that has come in its wake there's there's so much that you can learn about games i kind of want you to come back and just talk about like aaron black for two hours Yes. Oh my god. And so it's like the, it. you oh you can learn so much about games by studying Mortal Kombat is the point. And so for that reason Drum I'm roll. actually going to put it above Mario. Ooh! Again, that's not that's not because of, you know, it, it, the the different reasons, right? Different arguments, different things. If you want to learn about what makes good game design, and you need to study and learn and play the Mario games. If you want to learn about gaming culture, you need to study Mortal Kombat. I don't think I've ever wanted to be a video game scholar more than this episode. I don't think I've ever <laughs> wanted to be Johnny Cage more than right now. <laughs> okay, what's next? Next is the Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, either Master Duel or there's Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro. There's different uh, ones. I think it's Master Duel, but yeah. Master Duel. Let's see. Um, what's fascinating about Yu-Gi-Oh! is it's, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach this in reference to like chess. In the same way that I mentioned all the expansion pieces, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know how many cards there are in Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, you countless? Uh, it's I'm going to say two million. <laughs> that's not two billion. It's around the days you have a guess. I don't. Okay, I'm magic. I would say two million. Yu-Gi-Oh! I think I would say like I don't know, hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand. Pretty much, you're overshooting it, but it's it's around. Tw- it's a little over twelve thousand. That's so and, many cards. It's so and many. And the cards. the way that Magic has a legacy component where you sure. could play for the most part, Magic does like cubes and box sets where mm-hmm. we've calibrated these cards to work well and confront each other. Yeah. Yeah. But if you do legacy. That means the new cards are going to be played against every card ever printed. Mm-hmm. And Yu-Gi-Oh! works that way just by default. And so <laughs> you have to make a 40 to 60 card deck. You only are allowed three duplicates of the same card. And you can pick any card that you want. If it's a tournament, then there's ban lists. But outside of that, it's whatever theme you want. It's whatever thing you want. It's very accelerated gameplay. And so you have to figure out how... It's, a, it's like a programming nightmare. Because you have to figure out how, and it's always a little ruling nightmare of which cards trump each other, right? And so there's a lot of emerging gameplay that's like immediately shut down by Konami as an institution where we abuse a system because we figured out a cool combo of how this card interacts with that one. And then immediately it's banned or it's ruled out, you know, forbidden or limited. And so the give and take of the stress test of how players interact with Yu Gi Oh! is really fascinating. Um, and it's only grown more online as a presence in pandemic years. Um, I am going to put it above uh, Friday 13th and A. Hell yeah. Nice. And last one, God, what, 
William, I'm calling dibs on you when I'm making when I when I want to do this video essay about this game because I'm going to at some point, maybe for the 10th anniversary, because I think it's like next year or two years from now. But uh, I, honestly, the thing that turned me into like an everyday Twitch watcher. That's yeah. right. Uh, a god, an angel, a king, a prince, a messiah, and an all-terrain vehicle. You know where we're going. <laughs> Twitch plays Pokemon. Twitch, Twitch plays Pokemon as a social experiment, which we're going to get into in class, of what does it mean when you surrender agency to the collective, right? When you surrender... Surrender? No, start nine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Those bands. But yeah, so what happens when you lose the like, individuality of the avatar and surrender it to the collect to the hive mind, right? And yeah. furthermore, to the chat. what does it mean? What does it mean when you have a competing habitus where you have people that want to play the game a certain way and you have other people that want to disrupt and want to produce anarchy and want to troll and and want to where impeding the traditional gameplay becomes the new game. Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and so we are subject to the trolling conf divisional conflicting uh confrontational sociologies of online play and if you're a pokemon fan like a traditional one that adheres to the habitus what is the dismay what is the nihilism that you face think knowing that your pokemon community is ungovernable it is not cohesive it is not solidified and it takes you 16 days or whatever to get the damn thing done and so and, and then you create fan art, either trying to legitimize or, or commemorate the experience or also stress your dismay. And so if you can, one of you Google uh, like Pokemon or po Twitch plays Pokemon fan art, right? Oh. Of like the hive mind. Yeah, of the voices. Um, exactly. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a possession narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Of all these competing voices of the legion that is demon possessing Avatar Red. And we're going to talk about that game art. And so... Yeah, I, I, uh, my favorite... Because I, I wrote a paper for uh, uh, a contemporary myth class about Twitch Plays Pokemon. And my favorite art that I included in that is um, an artist rendition of when Destiny raided the the chat to, to try to try to get them to release uh, Zapdos. Really? And it is depicted as like an Egyptian hierog... Like... like like mosaic hieroglyph yeah of the computer yeah. stabbing everyone yes oh and it's you know like, what i'm talking about like, we're, we're doing i do we're doing this video yes. okay <laughs> this is different than doki doki this is what i it just making me think about possession and doki doki it's like doki doki if it was happening in real time wild okay yeah. that's yeah, yeah i was like just curious what the relationship My... to that was I'm, I'm i submitted something i need to revise it but to uh there's the journal of games criticism and yeah. we pitched our, our Twitch Plays Pokemon paper. And I'm, my writing partner is a guy named Jeremy Haynes, who works in, he's a South Asian scholar, but he's really gifted at affect theory. Mm -hmm. right? I love affect. Oh my God, and, send, send him my way. <laughs> and the whole point is like, even if you're not like a trolling asshole in real life, why do you become one online? Right? Like, why do you, like, what is, what is going on with how such a crowd based populace? Right? Why does it affect you to behave a certain way? We right? that's happened to us and people in our own chat. I yeah. mean, that's it's fascinating to watch. Gee, I'm just and I and I even get into the like. I wouldn't say that on the street if somebody's like trolling me, I'm like, what are you about? Like, I I get like kind of sensitive, <laughs> but in the context of this, I don't because I understand there's a performance of trollness. Well, I was going to oh, say, you and I are I having, like, very yeah, different we, reactions different. to Twitch yeah. plays Pokemon, William, because, like, I was not, I was not anarchy to troll. I was anarchy because all of the culture, the the religion that, that came out, the, the worldview that came out of this yeah. could not have happened if you were railroading the game. And I was very yes. adamant that I was going to start nine if they were going to, if they, if they were going to follow the heathen dome fossil and and railroad <laughs> us through the fucking game i was going to start nine because if yeah. because because then we would just be playing pokemon and not twitch plays pokemon if anyone like doesn't know about twitch plays pokemon this this must sound like we're actually when i gave this paper at afs the discussant said this was <laughs> this was like listening to an ethnography written in dog 
which is, I think, the greatest compliment ever. <laughs> the other fun thing of like how it becomes like it becomes a stage play for Pokemon viewers, consumers, etc. Right, and so the stakes are high oh. because of the they've already been initiated into the culture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but anywho, with all of that, <laughs> um, I will place it behind Super Mario. Oh, hell yeah. I respect that. Oh, and actually, look at this. That's fun. I have a Twitch Plus Pokemon poster, like, in this room. It's not on camera. It's, like, behind the door. I uh, can send you... I made an image um, and, and took it to the American no. Academy of Religion. And so when it was of... It's of Bird Jesus. It's of Bird Jesus? It's of Bird Jesus. There was only one. There was only... Oh, there was only... There was no God but Helix and Bird Jesus is his prophet. As as we were one to say in chat in those days, I drew it by hand and then gave it to a, an ex student of mine who their their sibling is really great at Photoshop and cleaned it up, took out the pencil marks, added great color. Hell yeah! And when and then I I blew it up and printed it on a on a print shop in San Antonio, and they were oh. like, we actually love printing weird shit like this. We have no idea what this <laughs> is. It, what it is. Did, did he have yeah. like his robe on? Did he yeah, have like, like his yes. vestment? Yeah. I can, I can send you an image, but I we have no idea what it is, and we um you know have no idea what it's for, but we we love getting weird things like this. Please, both of you, make this video essay, Dom. Uh, we've been telling Dom to make it eventually, but now the we're wait for the ten year anniversary. I swear. Oh my god, the two of you combined is going to make this the coolest freaking video. Let me see if I can. Um, I love. I'm I love. Dom, can, I... you, can you grab this image from Facebook? I uh, keep posting. Or do you want? Yeah. Or I'll do it in chat. Or yeah, not in chat, post... but I'll do it. I'll send you it to can... you through um, through Discord. You can send it to me through Discord. Yeah, okay. and they'll put it on chat. Let me do that. Let me see or I can I... share a screen. Is that easier, Dom? Or you should no. Chat. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I thought. Just put it in chat and I'll open it on my browser. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, hold on. Keep going. Raise your William, dongers, what? chat. We made it through this tier list. I wanted to ask yeah. what oh, game... I also, I also would add... In... Smash Brothers on there. I, I, I didn't know. Oh, I, uh, that was the question I was going to ask you. What would you add that's on your syllabus? I almost put Smash on here. here. I almost put Guacamelee on here. Smash is a here. good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's incredible. Um, okay, hold on. Wait. Before I answer that, um, can got you it. see if you got that image? And then... Oh, my God. <laughs> can people see that? Yes. Oh, oh, it's so. Oh my good. God! There is no God but the Helix, and Bird Jesus is his prophet. It's so good. It's so and good. So, I mean, like I also, have like a really high leveled uh, Amasar in Pokemon Go, and his name is is Helix. You know, like this will always be a part of how I like interact with Pokemon. Like these are this is not Ammonite and Pidgeot. This is Helix and Bird Jesus, and everyone since is Helix and Bird Jesus. So you want to know something funny? So I show this to my wife. Yeah. Right? And shout shout out to the woman I love. Mm -hmm. And I show her the Lord Helix one, right? And at the time, he had only seven limbs, right? Because it was pointing right, left, up, down. That's four. Mm -hmm. And then there was A, B, and start, and that's three. That's seven. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. she was mm -hmm. mad at this at the asymmetry. She's like, he should have eight hands, right? Yeah. And so. I'm like, but I don't know what else to put in the eighth hand, right? And so yeah. she's like, he needs eight. Give him an eighth. I don't know what, but I don't care what he's doing. Just make him do something. And so I add the do not fear mudra. That's right. And so yes. that, that is the circle. eighth. Do that is the fear. eighth hand. And it also binds, you know, the East, what meets West funny thing yes. about how religion is used in uh, Twitch Plays Pokemon fan art. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then, yeah, uh, Bird Jesus was also fun, adding the wings, making him gargantuan in size, playing with the robes. Yeah. So good. The Nautilus shell. Yeah. It's the Helix fossil. Um. <laughs> Whatever. Um, to answer your question, 
uh, go and watch like Maximilian Dodd's, you know, videos on why Smash is just like the way that he rephrases it is it's video games, video games, the game, video games, the game. I know that video. Yeah. Video games, the game. Yep. And he's not wrong. And so, you know, the, 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 he's, the way in which Smash has broken is down. Is that video barriers. called The Golden Age of Smash is now? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Yep, another one. And so th- the way in which like he is telling you that sm- to recognize so like video games especially occupy the space of popular culture of commercial exclusivity, <laughs> right? You're only going to get Freddy versus Jason once uh, New Line Cinema acquires the Jason character from Paramount, mm-hmm. right? You're only going to get, you know, X-Men into your Marvel movies once they get it from 20th Century Fox or once they do a deal with Sony for Spider-Man, right? Mm-hmm. And so the way in which the Forbidden Door has been opened with Smash Brothers, where you have Banjo-Kazooie, you have Pac-Man and Mega Man and Sonic and Cloud and all of these things where it's, it is transcended in his words again. It's religious language, right? Yeah. Smash mm-hmm. Brothers. As soon as you start doing these third-party things with Snake and whatever else, it is transcended just a Nintendo game. Even though Mario is all over the place, right? It has transcended a video game and now becomes a pop culture phenomenon because it is abusing what has been the convention of commercial exclusivity, and we are all the better for having it. I can I can talk for hours about how that is what World of Light is about that that is what like Galim and 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 Dark Darkrom or whatever his name is represent but we have already gone over time and I <laughs> we've gone way over time but William thank you for doing the let's, good work let's... that you do oh my let's god come yes. back. thank let's, you for... let's come back for let's more come games. no yeah I, no I yeah no brainer <laughs> come back come back on the show please. Back in, you and I can play Mortal Kombat and we can talk about our last Mortal Kombat episode. And uh, yeah, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for play Smash. being an interdisciplinary see ya, see ya, scholar. See thank you, you next for doing week. religious studies. Thank you for doing folklore. Thank you for yeah, p- being a gamer and teaching people how to do some cool shit and bring some some deeper meaning into their life. Chat, you know Chat's what to already do. already on it. Ladders. Ladders. It's already on it. Ladders in William. the chat for William. Uh, this is now your second appearance on the show. I hope you make a third next week. And thank you so much. Hopefully for more after spending that. Time with us, and hopefully more after that. Hopefully this just continues because we're, we're, this was one of my favorite interviews I ever it. conducted. William, you were really just like you were really Genuinely. just cooking. You were cooking. And you, you, I don't know if it's just like right, right on your brain. I don't know if it's teacher brain. I don't know if it's post dissertation brain or what. But everything that you said just was so clear and concise. And and I think that the the chat and hopefully the viewers at home are watching this later really were able to follow along um, with all the connections was, that you are making because I think that you just did that really well. Up. Like I Thank don't know. You. Yeah, hope there, this pops there's up. There's this there's this joke. Do you remember a long time ago in the before times when mm-hmm. like ever like this was the uh, hold on this was the first Obama election right mm-hmm. and Biden at the time was already getting shit for being old man gaff and other things right and mm-hmm. then really well in the vice presidential debate against sarah palin and the john stewart joke was guy must have upped his adderall medication or something <laughs> and so i always think about that anytime somebody compliments that like i did a good job i was like dude must have upped his adderall medication or something <laughs> <laughs> Quote, 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 quote,